Straight ahead on CCX News, a proposal for a school runs into opposition in Brooklyn Park. Plus, a lesson that an Armstrong teacher won't leave kids without. It's absolutely essential that these kids are given some personal finance education. And how the arts and music are teaching history and math. CCX News starts right now. Hello everyone and thanks for joining us. A Minneapolis charter school wants to relocate to Brooklyn Park. The undisclosed charter school could be located near an apartment complex on West Broadway. The matter went before the Brooklyn Park Planning Commission Wednesday night and its potential neighbors aren't all in. There's drugs and shooting going on at the apartment building and that has ended up in our front driveway and in our grass. Um, there's been drugs left in our front yard. No, I don't want a school there. No, we've, we've absorbed a lot because we're the older part of Brooklyn Park. We were the dumping station. It's not a done deal just yet. The Planning Commission recommended denial of the project due to traffic concerns. That stretch of West Broadway just south of 694 already has a fair amount of traffic on it, including bus traffic from other school area schools. Commissioners and neighbors alike were concerned that bus and parent traffic from yet another school in that area would just make matters worse. And I don't know how many cars fly around those buses already as is, and I'm hearing honking all in the morning because of that. I have a lot of concerns around traffic and I don't feel like we have a plan or know what the plan is. The proposal now goes to the Brooklyn Park City Council on February 25th. That body can still approve the measure despite the Planning Commission's vote. A Brooklyn Park tax preparer, meanwhile, is accused of tax fraud. The U.S. Attorney's Office announced a federal indictment Thursday that charges Eric Willor with 15 counts of aiding and assisting in the preparation of false tax returns. He ran a tax preparation business out of his home in Brooklyn Park. Prosecutors say Willor regularly prepared and filed returns using false and fraudulent itemized deductions to obtain large tax refunds for his clients. According to U.S. attorneys, his cases totaled about $316,000 in fraudulent tax refunds funds. Drones are taking over to help businesses at job sites and they will also be put to work at Plymouth City Hall. The City of Plymouth has adopted a policy on unmanned aerial vehicles or drones. City staff have been studying policies and procedures for the past few months. This week the council approved the purchase of three drones as well as licensing and training for eight drone pilots. The three drones will be used in several departments for a variety of purposes like taking photos and inspecting projects and land. Public safety would also use use the drones to search for missing persons or help apprehend a subject. Most of us can use a financial refresher every now and then. At Armstrong High School, students are learning financial lessons that will stay with them the rest of their lives. You can take out your notes. We're going to talk about uh, a little bit about personal finance today. The new semester just started at Armstrong High, and these seniors are already thinking about next year and college. It's absolutely essential that these kids are given some personal finance education. James so Rudelsheimer is an well, economics late, teacher here at Armstrong, and in this class, he's making sure his students have the financial tools they'll need once they graduate. They I want them to, to take steps to realize um, to make wise investments about what they're spending. And yes, most students do have to borrow money, but they can keep it manageable. And he's got some innovative ways to make that happen. These students so are running a college finance, economic simulator yeah. game to show them how quickly you can get into too yeah, much student debt right, so if you don't make game. good decisions. I thank Ms. Soretto-Scheimer for teaching us about this because, I mean, I don't think high school is placed enough um, like emphasis on you know, learning about debt and um, loans and stuff like that. And so I'm like really grateful for him for teaching us that. Caroline Wilcox took this class last semester. It's she be even like won $500 less. in an essay contest talking Wade about, about her experiences with the economic simulator. As you kept going, the debt kept racking up super, super fast. And so it was very, very nerve wracking to see the debt rack up so fast and then know that you're going to you know, experience that next year. And it's right. had an Another impact on her thing thinking about college. I'm debating me 
debating between two schools based on like how much money I'm going to you know have to pay when I get out of college. Ruttlesheimer says that's a great start and he hopes the other lessons he teaches about finances throughout students lives take hold as well. We're doing a disservice as uh, as schools to send kids out to the real world if they haven't had a, a personal finance education. Uh, don't understand uh, anything about uh, the documents. Carolina has absorbed that education too. She's not going to waste her $500 winnings. She'll use it to help pay for college. On this Valentine's Day, Brooklyn Park City officials held an event called Fall in Love with Brooklyn Park. The city had more than 100 real estate professionals, realtors, and city staff attending, where they learned about Brooklyn Park's demographic trends and the state of the housing values in the northwest suburbs. City officials say this event is vital to continuing the growth of Brooklyn Park. We want to equip them with the right data that can help them carry out their work. So when somebody's buying a house in Brooklyn Park or opening up a business in Brooklyn Park, they want to know, is there enough housing there? How the school district? What's the public safety like in Brooklyn Park? This event has been taking place for 27 years now. There are all kinds of businesses having fun with Valentine's Day. You've probably seen the heart-shaped pizzas out there. At one Robinsdale restaurant, though, you'll see even, a more, even more love put into the food. Walleye cakes uh, are hand-created by the chef. He's back there cutting them out right now. We uh, lightly bread them, flash fry them, serve them on a better mix greens with a roasted red pepper aioli. That's right, those are heart-shaped walleye cakes, and they won't last long, I might add. It's all reservation-based at a place like Nona Rosa's on Valentine's Day night. They're also serving up heart-shaped ravioli. For the restaurant, it makes for one busy day. It's one of our most popular shifts of the year as far as um, the quantity of people we serve in a very short period of time. We're expecting about 280 people to be in our dinner crowd this evening. For owners Tina and Francesco Sulia, the head chef, Valentine's Day carries a little extra meaning. 11 years ago this week, they got engaged. Still ahead on CCX News, we'll take you to a crystal school where the arts and music play an important role in learning math and social studies. Plus, we'll look ahead to a special event coming up Friday night at Osseo High School honoring a special championship basketball team. But first, colder on Friday, but plenty of sunshine. About 400 students from 12 communities attend 4th through 8th grade at the Fair School Crystal. And you can't tell a story about the Fair School Crystal without having a focus on arts. And that's the focus of today's School Spotlight. It took three days to make this so far. Every grade at the Fair School Crystal has an artist in residence. Let's watch for the big buffalo with the gray horns. Julie Boada is a Native American visual artist with a background in puppetry. We're working toward a puppet performance of indigenous resistance. The culmination of this history lesson will be a performance. Do you like to show in a performance or do you like to stay hidden? Where there's a role for everyone. Sometimes visual artists don't feel comfortable being on stage, but you can make this beautiful work that then is on stage and then the kids that want to shine as actors can also shine as actors and making a little hole. Seeing students shine when they find the art that fits is a big payoff for staff here. We may have a kid or two who gets in trouble but then when they get on stage totally different kid and so that makes my job more exciting for me because I know that's coming right that's the, the end product. Principal Zorba Ross says there's beauty in watching how a student can grow when motivated. <laughs> song is always a motivator for students in choir class. As you can tell by now, exposing students to a variety of arts is a big part of what sets Fair School Crystal apart. It's a blessing, you know, for all of these kids to be able to participate. They may not love each and every one of those um, arts classes, but they get exposed to it. And I think that is the most important thing. And all of my groups, keep it up. That exposure happens in classes you'd least expect, too. Take algebra, for example. Vermont equals M, X plus B. B is the Y intercept, you'll see. 
it's not unusual for students to sing as part of their lesson. ¿En qué colores? Or how about Spanish class? Aquí necesitan más amarillo. Students are speaking Spanish, but painting emojis to learn vocabulary words about emotion. Well, it really um, adds that visual piece and that kinesthetic piece where what kids can really do and create. It's not just memorizing lists or things like that, but they are able to really um, feel what they are learning and create something. The art focus at Fair School Crystal isn't about creating a beautiful finished product or turning students into art masters. Instead, it's a way for students to love learning. But it was that process of using art, whether it be songs or dancing or drawing, painting, acting, all of those different things that help them learn the content. The teachers at Fair School Crystal have an exciting training workshop coming up too. Crayola, as in the Crayon Company, is going to come talk to them about new ways to use arts in the classroom. Always cool to visit that school. Still ahead, a special challenge for Wyzetta students that could one day pay off with a home remodeling project and more. But first, highlights from playoff girls hockey as Wyzetta faced off with the defending state champions in the section tournament. John Jacobson is in next. Section 6AA is Minnesota's toughest for girls hockey, featuring the state's top two ranked teams in Class AA, Blake and Edina. Wyzetta's had a great season, but the Trojans would have to get through both of those teams to reach state. Former Edina great and now coach Sammy Reber and the Hornets taking on the Trojans in the semifinals. Wyzetta's Maddie McCollins redirects the shot from Casey Johnson for a goal. The Trojans tie at 1-1 in the first period. Late in the first, Edina's Hannah Chorsky skates out front of the Trojans net, roofs the shot in for a goal. It's 2-1 Hornets after one. Second period, and a great pass here by the Hornets' CC Bowlby right onto the stick of Tella Jungles. Jungles puts Edina ahead 3-1. to one. The Trojans get that one back late in the period. McKenzie Schindler's pass frees Gretchen Branton on a breakaway. The Trojans are within a goal again. It's 3-2 to two after two. But Wyzetta can't get the equalizer in the third, and the Hornets score a power play goal in the game's final minutes. Katie Davis scores. Edina skates into the section final with a 4-2 win over Wyzetta. Champlain Park has been a consistent winner in boys basketball in the Northwestern Ribbon Conference for the past decade plus. The Rebels look to wrap up another North Division title when they hosted Blaine Wednesday night. First half and Blaine's Lucas Larson cans a long three for an early Bengals lead. Rebels football quarterback Bennett Otto, the receiver on this pass from Jace Miller. Otto finishes and CP builds a lead. Jason Call hits a three from the corner for Blaine as the Bengals keep pace. Call scores 20 points in the game. Time winding down in the first half. Jacob Johnson's shot is off, but Alex John gets the tap and Champlain Park leads 29-20. John with a nice game scoring 15 points. Otto knocks the ball loose and then gets the return pass from Cooper Olson. Otto scores for a 45-34 second half lead. And then he'll zip a pass to Olsen, whose first shot is blocked, but he'll get the rebound and put back, plus the foul. Champlain Park wins 76-1. They take a three-game lead on the second-place Bengals. 30 years ago next month, the Osseo girls basketball team won a state championship, a team that sparked a run of four state title game appearances in 12 years and another championship in 2000. Friday night at halftime of the Orioles girls varsity game, members of the team will be honored and recognized in a special ceremony. That Osseo team finished with a 24-2 record and defeated Little Falls in the state championship game. For first-year Osseo coach Doug Erlene, it was a team that deserved recognition that they'll receive Friday night in the Osseo Fieldhouse. Well, I, I talked to head coach Dave Thorpe um, quite a few times over the past, you know, six to eight months, and you know, one of the things he talked about was they really, he really feels like they kind of changed the girls' basketball, the game of girls' basketball in the state, um, just how they play. They played 84 feet, and they just were up and intense, and um, I think that's a big thing. Um, and so as we move forward as a program, it's not only kind of a night to celebrate and remember what they did uh, for us as, as a program, but also to kind of celebrate uh, what they meant for girls basketball in the state too. Those 1989 players and their families will be treated to a pregame meal as well, and players will cut down the nets after the game to remember that championship team. All of them are encouraged to attend. Well, if the early bird gets the worm, then it figures that the early fish might as well. In this week's CCX Sports Ice Fishing Tip, Terry Tuma talks about the best time to catch them during the winter. 
What are the best times to catch crappies and sunfish during the winter? Well, really the best time that we've done lots of years of experimentation are early morning hours, primarily because of the zooplankton food sources. And so early morning hours is gonna be a half hour before sunrise. Unfortunately, most anglers coming out are going to target these fish about 8 to 8.30 in the morning, 9 o'clock. We do not want to do that because we have to really take advantage of that zooplankton food sources. And the primary food source under those kind of conditions are going to be Daphnia. They're light sensitive. They cannot get away from this predator and they'll dive down into some of those weed areas. So that's one thing we have to take a look at. And generally speaking, going to have a good bite early, early morning. Then it's going to lessen as far as a more a less fish less fish smaller size and smaller size on cloudy days uh, a lake that has a lot of dark water a lot of snow cover that can change you can have a pretty good bite going all day long so do try to really take a look at the time of the days that you're going to be fishing the other is the noise factor you know early morning out you're one of the first ones out there it's going to be minimal amount of noise big ingredient in catching fish in the winter time thanks terry that's all for sports shannon's back with more in a moment and finally, a lesson that could pay dividends down the road for a future home remodeling project. This week at the Builders and Remodelers show, some Wyzetta students had their construction skills put to the test. I love being able to like build stuff with my own hands, and, like being able to see progress as it's like going along. At the end of the day, I can like look back and just be like, hey, I built that. And I think that's a really great feeling. I think we at YZ have always produced really high quality students in the last several years we've really put a lot of resources into the technology education program and students are coming out with really high level skills. We have several things kids can do. We have uh, intro to wood manufacturing classes, we have construction classes, so from the trade side we've got a lot of things. I've already created my own blueprint for my dream house and I want to build it. That's my dream, to have my own house that I personalized, that I made my own. I think the advantage of coming to the Builders Remodelers show is that students are able to, one, look around and see everything that's available, and they're also able to talk to industry people. So they're able to, to see that what they're learning in class is really relevant to what industry is asking of students, and they're also able to make some great industry connections, and there's also a little bit of pressure on them that we can't put on in the classroom. I plan on either going to Hennepin Technical College or like Stout and become a carpenter or an electrician. Not only does it pay well, but it like, it's fun. And thanks to photojournalists Neil Persley and Dustin Scholl for helping put together that piece. And before we go, we will leave you with a picture of Boarboom Veterans Park in downtown Osseo. The Osseo Lions Club put up a big heart on the stage in the park, and they, it made for a very snowy Valentine on Thursday. So enjoy, happy Valentine's Day, and thanks for watching.